The grass withers, the flower fades, but the Word of our God stands forever. The Word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. Blessed are those who hear the Word of God and observe it. Today we're here to study the Word of God. We are in a new section. If you don't have the notes, there are notes in the back. We are looking at God the Holy Spirit, His filling, His filling. We have studied many different doctrines with regard to the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, but today we are studying His filling, the filling of the Holy Spirit. And it's an important doctrine for us to understand, much misunderstood doctrine in the Christian faith. But we need to understand what the filling of the Holy Spirit is all about, why it's important for us to walk step by step with God and why it is important in terms of our bearing of fruit in our Christian lives. Before we begin our study, however, we need to take a moment for silent prayer so that we might be filled with the Spirit. We can confess sins, be restored to fellowship, and indeed experience the filling of the Spirit in our lives. And that's an important thing to understand. It is a reality. The filling of the Spirit is a reality. But it is a very important reality in terms of our Christian walk. Let's pray together. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the way you have blessed us in your grace and in your love. We do not deserve any blessings at all. We deserve to be thrown in the lake of fire for all of eternity, and yet because of your love and your grace and the provision of your Son, Jesus Christ, to be our sacrifice. He stood in our place and bore the sins on that cross and because of Him we now have eternal life through nothing more than faith in Him. And Father, we recognize that we have been so blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And Father, help us to understand what those blessings are. Help us to tap into the amazing supernatural resources that are available to us, the, the spiritual provisions that You've given to us to allow us to excel and glorify you in this life. Help us understand, as we learn about the filling of the Spirit, help us understand that that as born-again believers, we can succeed or we can fail in this life, and we want to understand how to succeed because we love you and we want to bring you glory. We want to take these earthen vessels and be able to glorify you in these vessels of sin, and yet these vessels that we can offer to you as a living and holy sacrifice. So, Father, we ask that you would work in and through us to be, to be pleasing in your sight and to bring glory to your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray these things in his most precious and holy name. Amen. So we will be looking at the filling today. Um, before we jump in to our study, I want to, uh, I want to sort of reiterate what I was just praying about. Uh, one of the things that I was, I was talking with my mom on the phone uh, last night, and we were talking about various blessings that have occurred in my, in my life and whatnot. And, and I said, you know, Mom, I just uh, I don't deserve any of that. I just don't deserve any of it. And she says, oh, well, that's not true. Well, that's, that's a mom talking to her son, right? I mean, that's the way she's going to talk to her son. But as uh, born-again believers, we need to understand this reality. It's so important for us to understand the reality that we don't deserve anything. What we really deserve, I should say, actually, is punishment, the lake of fire. That's what we really deserve. Uh, But yet we're not going to be punished that way, are we? We're not going to spend all of eternity in the lake of fire. But all of that is by the grace of God. And so when you think about your life and you think about your abilities or you think about your talents or you think about the ministries that you have in your life or you think about anything and everything, you think about this little church on the side of the road, you think about your car that you drove here to the church today, you think about the house you live in, you think about the friends you have, you think about... Just go on and on and on. All of it is by grace. It's all the grace of God. And one of the conversations I had with my brother when we were on vacation up in Colorado is he said something that really struck a chord with me, and it's something I've been trying to preach uh, at this church, and I will continue to try to preach it here as long as the Lord allows. And that is, we need each other. 
He said that he believes that that's the biggest thing that people miss, is that we need each other. As born-again believers, we've been given incredible grace blessings by God, and we're empowered in a way that's above and beyond anything this world understands. But one of the grace gifts that we've been given is each other. And it's one of the things we talked about in the lesson on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We are baptized into Christ. We are baptized into the body of Christ. And as members, fellow members of the body of Christ, recognize that everybody that's in this room needs one another. Now, you may not want to admit it. You may not want to believe it. But it's a reality. Paul talked about the members of the body. How can an eye hear? An eye can't hear. An eye can see, but it can't hear. So as you have a body, you have ears that hear, eyes that see, a nose that smells. So in order to put together a body that's complete, you need eyes and you need ears and you need noses and you need all of these things to put a body together. And that's the way God has designed us, is a body of believers. And that, that example, that analogy of the human body is part of the description of what we are. Now, I have things that I could offer this body of local believers, but every one of you has something you can offer. And we need each other. And the thing we need to understand is we can't fulfill that in supplying need, the need of others unless we're humble enough to recognize that everything we have is by grace. And everything that we're able to provide and everything that we're able to give to others around us is all by the grace of God. If we're, too, if we're too full of ourselves to recognize the grace that's been supplied, we're incapable of being able to come alongside and supply the needs of others in the body. It's critical to understand that. It's a simple matter, but Gary hit on it over and over again in the first hour. Humility. 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 It's a critical doctrine for us to understand. And I'll tell you this right now. It takes humility to recognize that you need other people. Because we all want to stand on our own two feet. And we all want to be able to say, I can do it. I can do it all by myself. Well, let me tell you a little secret. That's not how God designed us. Now, if God puts you in a situation where you have to face the enemy all by yourself, are you really all by yourself, first of all? You're not really all by yourself anyway, are you? Because God is right there and he knew that you were going to be in that situation and he'll give you and supply you everything you need to stand up to the schemes of the devil all by yourself. But he designed the body of believers that make up the body of Christ to function one with another. And you really do need one another. I need you, you need me, we all need one another. And I pray that somehow I can ultimately communicate this to all of you. And that's why it's so important that even the things that I talked about a, a couple of weeks ago about how we need to humble ourselves enough to have fellowship with those who we may not have a, a personality that meshes with. There's going to be individuals in the body of Christ that you don't mesh with personality-wise. Does that mean you can't have fellowship with them? Of course it doesn't. You can have fellowship with anybody in the body of Christ. And if nothing else, you can fellowship in the things of the Lord. And I encourage you to foster that, to work on that, to develop that, to develop that fellowship one with another, even if you disagree on everything except for the things about our Father in Heaven and our Savior Jesus Christ. I mean, you get... <laughs> I often think of the people in the military. You get somebody in the Navy, they won't say anything good about the people in the Army. You get people in the Army, the Army and the Navy, they just have bad things to say about the Air Force. Everybody picks on the Air Force, by the way. I don't know why that is. But... Uh, they, talk, they, they say they have a life of, uh, of luxury in the Air Force, but uh, the reality of it is, you know, you talk about the Marines, you talk, just go through the list, the Army, Navy, Marines, Air Force, whatever it is. Um, they all will bicker about one another in terms of the different, the different uh, military forces. But when it comes to Christ, can't we have a union in that regard? Can't we fellowship in the things of Christ? And by the way, a lot of that's just ribbing in the military, but... Uh, but they're pretty serious about it. But, uh, but, but we should be able to fellowship in the things of the Lord. We really should. And you've got to recognize that the believer that this, this believer that you have nothing in common with except for your faith, that may be the very believer that God has designed to come alongside you 
in a particular situation. And so if you, in your pride and in your stubbornness, I know a lot about stubbornness, by the way, just ask my wife, but, uh, <laughs> but in our stubbornness and in our pride, if we do not develop fellowship with that believer, then when that time comes where that believer was the one God designed to come alongside, they won't be there, will they? They won't be there to come alongside because you're the one who broke fellowship with them for nothing more than some sort of petty reason. We should be able to fellowship in the things of the Lord, but I'm trying to encourage you today that you actually need one another. And God brought us together as a body of believers in this local church, and that forms an even greater need, an even greater interdependence upon one another. So as you develop in your Christian walk and you grow and you mature, recognize that the reason you're growing and the reason you're maturing is not only that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil, but also that you will be able to help your brothers and sisters in Christ stand firm against the schemes of the devil. We are all in this together. And uh, my brother's real simple statement, you know what, we need each other. That just really resonated with me. As born-again believers, we need each other, and we need to realize that. We also need, by the way, in order to glorify God, we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So let's study that. What do you say? We'll take a look at the filling of the Holy Spirit. Filling of the Holy Spirit defined. In contrast with the work of the Holy Spirit in salvation, such as regeneration, indwelling, sealing, baptism, the filling of the Holy Spirit is related to Christian experience, power, and service. Filling of the Holy Spirit is related to Christian experience, power, and service. So there's a big contrast here. The, these, these other things are the work of the Holy Spirit in salvation. Regeneration takes place one time in your life. Indwelling takes place one time in your life. Sealing is one time. Baptism is one time. But the filling of the Holy Spirit, uh, unless you're a lot better at resisting sin than I am, you're going to find that the filling of the Holy Spirit is something that's repeated over and over again in your life. The works of the Spirit in salvation are once and for all, but the filling of the Holy Spirit occurs repeatedly in the life of the believer. Hopefully. Hopefully. Uh, if you're, again, if you're like me, you might find that, uh, you know, you wandered off in the weeds and you spent a number of years of your life uh, walking in darkness. And so for a long time, I was not filled with the Holy Spirit. I was regenerated, I was indwelled, I was sealed, I had been baptized by the Holy Spirit. All of those things were true, but I was not filled with the Holy Spirit. I was walking in the darkness, not in the light. Prior to the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit did uh, fill believers. There's some examples of scriptures here. We'll take a look at those, but on the whole, relatively few individuals received this empowerment. Let's take a look at... Uh, Exodus chapter 28 and verse 3. In this particular verse, it's described as an endowment. Let's back up to verse 1. Then bring near to yourself Aaron, your brother, and his sons with him from among the sons of Israel to minister as a priest to me, Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar, Aaron's sons. You shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, for glory and for beauty. You shall speak to all the skillful, skillful persons whom I have endowed with the spirit of wisdom that they may... Let me say it again, that they make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister as a priest to me. So here we have this endowment with the spirit of wisdom. Now see, in the New American Standard, uh, it's got a lowercase s. I would say actually probably should be an uppercase s at this point. So be this, the Holy Spirit, they've been endowed with the spirit of wisdom, that they make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister as a priest to me. So here's this picture of the, of the endowment, the empowerment that comes from the Holy Spirit to these individuals that they might be able to make the garments. We can also take a look at a few more of these. Exodus 31 verse 3. Back up to verse 1 there also. Exodus chapter 31 starting in verse 1. 
Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. I have filled him with the Spirit of God and wisdom. I mean, not much doubt about the wording of that. It's pretty straightforward. I have filled him with the Spirit of God and wisdom and understanding and knowledge and in all kinds of craftsmanship to make artistic designs for work in gold and silver and in bronze and in the cutting of stones for settings and in the carving of wood that he may work in all kinds of craftsmanship. All right, so here we have this example of an individual, Bezalel, being filled with the Spirit. This is an Old Testament context. Old Testament context. Let's skip over. We'll take a look at Luke 1.15. We'll skip uh, Exodus 35.31. We'll take a look at Luke 1.15. I recognize this is prior to Pentecost. This is in our New Testament. Well, this is prior to Pentecost. We're still in the dispensation. By the way, what comes next after we finish our uh, filling of the Holy Spirit lessons is we're going to be looking at dispensations and ages. And trust me when I tell you, we're going to be there for a while. We're going to be studying dispensations and ages, and it's going to correlate very well with uh, our study in eschatology. As we begin to understand the things of eschatology, we're going to see how the dispensation and ages fit together in the plan of God. This is um, Zechariah. We're talking to Elizabeth here. He says, you will have joy. Let me back up to verse 14. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and he will drink no wine or liquor, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. Now, that's a fascinating verse. That's a fascinating verse. Who are we talking about here? John the baptizer, yes, John the baptizer. Uh, so he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. So here's somebody but prior to Pentecost who is filled with the Holy Spirit. We'll skip over uh, verses 41 and 67 and look at Luke 4, 1. Now we're talking about our Savior. And it says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led around by the Spirit in the wilderness for forty days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days, and when they had ended, he became hungry. And I love the way the scriptures are on this, because uh, <laughs> what does it say? He ate nothing during those days. But then it says, and when they had ended, he became hungry. That means for forty days he walked around eating nothing, but he wasn't hungry. He's full of the Holy Spirit, right? He's filled with the Holy Spirit. Also, I got some insight into this talking to Pastor Robbie Dean. I don't know if, uh, I know a number of you know who Pastor Robbie Dean is down at West Houston Bible Church. And he was talking about fasting. He said, you know, that after you fast for a certain period of time, you stop being hungry. You stop being hungry at all. And actually what happens is when you first put food into your mouth, you become ravenous, basically. You know, as soon as you start to eat something, you become extremely hungry. But uh, there's a period of time where you just experience no hunger. But here, this is something more than just a uh, more than just an earthly thing. This is uh, this is a supernatural empowerment of the Holy Spirit that Jesus was able to eat nothing for forty days, and uh, he didn't become hungry until the end. Now the devil said to him, "If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread." And Jesus answered him, "It is written, man shall not live on bread alone." And this is a wonderful passage here because every single time the the devil throws something before him, he answers with scripture. And this is something that Gary talked about last hour. How much scripture do you have in your soul? How much are you able to recall? What can you bring to mind as you're encountering a test or you're finding yourself uh, in a difficult situation of whatever kind? What do you have in your soul? Now, that doesn't mean we're blessed in this country that we can probably just go into the into the bedroom or the living room and pick up a Bible and start reading scriptures and ask for wisdom, as Gary talked about. We can ask for wisdom and hope that the Lord will take us to a place in the scriptures that will give us the, the, His words that we need for that particular moment. But how much more powerful is it if you have that doctrine already in your soul? And I want you to think about this. Over in many of the countries where we go do missionary work, for example, over in the Philippines, where they have ministries to these rural areas, 
in many of those communities, there is precisely one Bible in the whole town. They have one Bible, and that's the one the pastor reads. And so the individuals that live in that town, if they don't have it resident in their soul, what do they do? I guess they go run to the pastor, right? They go run to the pastor. You know, I'm in this situation, you know, help me with this. But the, how much better is it if you have the doctrine already in your soul? And that just doesn't happen. You can't just put your, put your Bible underneath your pillow and lay your head on top of it and hope that some kind of osmosis is going to take place. It doesn't work that way. You have to study the Word of God and you have to be diligent about it. You have to do it on a on a daily basis and if you're unable to do it on a daily basis you have to do it as often as the Lord allows you to do it and just immerse yourself in the word that's the word that I like to use is immersion you just immerse yourself in the word of God and uh, it's amazing how the Holy Spirit will recall these things to mind when you encounter some kind of a test but again on the whole relatively few individuals receive this empowerment that we call being filled with the Holy Spirit but that's not true today. We have the ability for every born-again believer has the ability to be filled. There is no indication in scriptures that the filling of the Spirit was available to every believer before, before Pentecost. There's, there's absolutely no indication. When we learn about the filling of the Spirit, we learn about these, these uh, things that are available to us as we learned the last hour. We are chosen people, aren't we? We are chosen people. We are the elect of the church. We have been chosen as part of the body of Christ and and what we've been chosen to, by the way, is a life where we have so many spiritual assets available to us that Israel didn't have. And you've been chosen for that. You've been chosen to have the filling of the Holy Spirit, for example, that we're talking about today, that only a few believers had in the times of Israel and all the times before, in the time of man or Gentiles before that and so on. Very few believers had this, but every one of us have the capacity to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You've been chosen for that. Now, since you've been chosen for that, God expects something of you, doesn't he? We have so much more accountability today than the people of Israel did. And go through your scriptures. Go look at the book of Judges and look at how they succeeded and failed and succeeded and failed and succeeded and failed. And it kept going on that way where they would turn to God, then they would turn away. They would turn to God, then they would turn away. Well, much more is expected of us because of all the grace blessings that he's bestowed upon us. So when you look at this and you look at scriptures and you realize, wow, look at all that the believers in the Old Testament were able to accomplish, and they didn't have this. Look at Daniel that we've been studying on and his prayers and the power of his prayers, and yet Daniel was not somebody who had the grace blessings that we do. Look at David and all that he accomplished. I mean, he had failures as well, but look at all that he accomplished in his, in his life, and yet he didn't have the filling of the Spirit. Now, he was one that, that had the Spirit come upon him and stayed with him most of his earthly life. Again, that was unusual, very unusual in Old Testament times, but not today. Every single born-again believer has these things available. It's very important to understand that. Beginning with the day of Pentecost, a new period began in which the Holy Spirit would work in every believer. Each is indwelt by the Spirit and can be filled with the Spirit. Notice that can be. That's not a guarantee. We are indwelled. Every born-again believer is indwelled with the Spirit. And we have the capacity to be filled with the Spirit. And that's what we're going to learn about today, is what it means to be filled with the Spirit. Numer numerous examples are given in the New Testament to confirm this conclusion. All right, we've got a bunch of passages in Acts. I'll turn to a few of these. Acts chapter 4 and verse 8, verse 31. Acts 6, 3. We'll turn to Acts chapter 4 in verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, If we are on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man, as to how this man has been made well, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name this man stands here before you in good health. He, that is referring to Jesus Christ, is the stone which, is, which was rejected by you, the builders, but 
which became the chief cornerstones, the two cornerstones, excuse me, and there is no sal- there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Anyone, I want you to remember this right here, this verse, Acts chapter 4 in verse 12. Anyone who tells you there's many paths to heaven, just open your Bible to Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. There is no salvation. Or let me read it exactly as it's written here. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Jesus Christ is the only way. And it's very clear in that verse. There is salvation in no one else. So take them to that verse and make sure they understand that. But here it says that Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit when he spoke these words. We'll skip over verse 31. We'll go to Acts chapter 6 in verse 3. We'll actually back up to verse 1. It says, Now at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. So a complaint rose up. These things happen, right? There was a situation and a complaint rose up. So the twelve summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, It is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. So they had a problem, didn't they? They didn't have enough time to both spend their time in the word of God and prepare themselves spiritually to be able to lead spiritually and to be able to also serve tables. It wasn't that they were unwilling to serve. This goes right back to the lesson everybody had yesterday. The men's prayer meeting and the ladies yesterday had a study in meekness. Meekness does not mean weakness, by the way. Meekness means humility. A heart attitude, being willing to serve. In fact, one of the words in the Greek is an interesting word because it means somebody who actually has the capacity to lead but is willing to serve under someone else. It's humility is what that implies. So it's not as though they were unwilling to serve, but in order to serve, they were having to neglect their studies in the Word of God. They were having to neglect the things of the Word of God in their own, in their own particular ministries, and it was not desirable to do that. And it says, therefore, in verse 3, therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. All right, so that's what they, this is basically the deacons, the idea of the deacons, right? Those that would serve and the, the others would focus their time in the ministry of the word and then others would take up some of the other tasks such as serving tables and whatever else was necessary. Well, full of the Holy Spirit, what, what is that about? I mean, do we, let me <laughs> give you a modern day example. Would you go out and select somebody who's running around in carnality and have them be one of your deacons? Probably not a good idea. Somebody who's mired in uh, carnality, somebody who's mired in the things of the flesh, you would not want to pick them as somebody to serve on your deacon board. And so instead, you want to find somebody who is full of the Spirit and of wisdom. That speaks of a maturity, doesn't it? Somebody who's spiritually mature, somebody who's full of the Spirit. So very important to understand that. Uh, We have Acts um, 7.55 and 11.24. We'll skip over to 13.9. Acts 13.9. Well, what we got? We got this magician guy. If you look in verse 8, we got this magician guy who doesn't like what they're doing. He's trying to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who was also known as Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, fixed his gaze on him. I can only imagine what that must have been like. I bet that was pretty intense, actually. <laughs> And said, you who are full of all deceit and fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease to make crooked the straight ways of the Lord? Wow. Yeah. (laughs) Now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and not see the sun for a time. And immediately a mist and a darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking those who would lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed what he saw, 
what had happened, being amazed at the teaching of the Lord. Now see, we see this example here. Here's Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, fixed his gaze on him, and oh my goodness, he unleashed a rebuke, did he not? Quite the rebuke. All right, it's also in verse 52, but we'll turn over to Ephesians 5.18, because this is a very important verse for us to look at. Because we're going to gather some things from this verse. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Ephesians 5.18. Let's back up. Verse 15. Therefore, be careful how you walk. Not as unwise men, but as wise. Be careful how you walk. Boy, that, I could just stop right there. Be careful how you walk. All of us need to be careful how we walk. Not as unwise men, but as wise. Making the most of your time because the days are evil. And evil men do evil things. I was in our Greek class today. The days are evil. Verse 17. So then, do not be foolish. Born again believer in Jesus Christ, capable of being foolish. We all are. Pointing the finger firmly at myself when I say this. I can be a fool at times. Do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart. To the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to, to God, even the Father, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Boy, there's some doctrine in there. Be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Is your pastor going to be subject to you? You bet he is. If he doesn't, then you need to be looking for another pastor. We are subject to one another, and that includes everybody in the body of believers in a local church. Be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. By the way, as we're singing the hymns, that's a, that's a, a process of, of praise to God. We're worshiping Him as we sing the hymns, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. But not only are we worshiping God and praising Him, we're speaking to one another, aren't we? That's what it says right there. Because as you're sitting there singing a hymn, you're delivering a message to everybody in the body of believers. But this verse 18, do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Now I want you to think about this for a second. What happens when you get drunk? The alcohol has an influence upon you and affects your thinking, it affects your words, it affects your actions. I would quote a a little comedy skit from Bill Cosby right now, but it might be offensive to some. But, uh, you know, if, if you get drunk and your personality changes, you know, do you go from somebody who's kind to somebody who's not kind? What about if the alcohol just uh, intensifies your personality? Well, what if your personality is not very good to begin with? But think about this for a second. When you're under the influence of alcohol, it affects everything about what you're doing, your thoughts, your words, your actions. And you're filled with the wrong spirit. That's exactly right. But what I want you to realize, that's exactly right. But what I want you to realize is that, that's, that's very astute actually. But what I want you to realize is that when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, it has the same effect on your life. It's going to affect your thinking. It's going to affect your words. It's going to affect your actions. So think about that for a second. There's a reason why God the Holy Spirit wrote this passage this way. Because the idea of what happens to us when we are uh, under the influence of alcohol, we want to recognize that when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you are under the influence of God the Holy Spirit. And some people will drink so much that they become controlled by their drinking. Well, we don't want to do that. We want to instead be controlled by the Holy Spirit. So there's a reason why God wrote this passage this way. Very important passage. The filling of the Holy Spirit is a spiritual state where the Holy Spirit is supernaturally. I want you to realize we're not talking about just some sort of natural ability here. 
The Holy Spirit is supernaturally empowering the believer such that he is able to produce fruit or divine good in his life. Now, if I'm walking around in the power of the flesh, if I'm carnal, I can go around doing nice things to people. I might have a personality where I have a particularly sweet personality and I can do nice things and, and all of that, but that's just human good. The Bible teaches about good that does not glorify God. There are things, by the way, the, we're going to look at this a little bit when we, uh, when we talk about um, the eschatology study, but when we, when we look at what happened in the garden, the fall in the garden, I, excuse me, when we talk about the ages and, uh, ages and dispensations, when we talk about that, We'll be looking at what happened in the garden at the fall. Well, when the fall took place, they partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And some people misunderstand that and think that it's good on one side and evil on the other. Both of those things are bad things that they were not supposed to know about. One of them is human good. That is the good we can try to produce on our own apart from God. And then there's evil. Everybody understands the evil part, but the good that's mentioned there is the good that Satan would have us to do. That is trying to do good things apart from God. And that's what I, the term I use is human good. There's a lot of pastors that do. Human good. But this, being filled with the Holy Spirit, supernaturally empowers us to produce divine good. When you are able to do things for others, when you're able to minister to others, when you're able to perform, um, perform the things that God would have you to do in your life, under the filling of the Holy Spirit, that bears fruit. And it's the fruit of... The Spirit, right? He's, it's the fruit of the Spirit. So what happens is it's not, uh, it's not the... I'm trying to figure out who I can pick on here. It's not the fruit of Ken, and it's not the fruit of Jake, and it's not the fruit of Becky. It's not the fruit of anybody like that. It's the fruit of the Spirit. That's important to understand. The, one, the fruit that's being born is the fruit of the Spirit, and it can't take place unless you are filled, influenced, and under the control of God the Holy Spirit. Instead of uh, the rare occurrence that we saw before Pentecost, today the normal spiritual state for the believer, I'm going to say that again, the normal spiritual state for the believer is to be filled with the Spirit and we are commanded to be so. And that's what we just saw in Ephesians 5.18. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, when I say the normal state, what I mean by that is not that you spend most of your time there. I hope you do. What I mean by the normal state is that that is where we are to be when we're properly functioning as a born-again believer. It's the normal state. It's where we're properly functioning as a born-again believer. Many believers, I promise you, many believers today spend very little time filled with the Spirit. So for them, it's not that they're filled with the Spirit all the time. They are rarely filled with the Spirit. In fact, they're more like somebody from the Old Testament times who barely ever knows the filling of the Spirit. But it is the normal state. It's where we're functioning as God has designed us to function. That is filled with the Spirit. By the way, you notice, before I go on to this next point, you notice when we talked about indwelling, we talked about regeneration, we talked about sealing, we talked about baptism, we talked about all these other doctrines. I never turned to a passage where we, we were commanded to be indwelled, did I? Or that we were commanded to be regenerated, or that we were commanded to be sealed, or that we were commanded to be baptized. All of these things are ministries of the Holy Spirit that take place the moment of your salvation. But we do have a passage that commands us to be filled. What that means is that you can either be filled or not be filled. You don't have any choice when it comes to the indwelling or the sealing or the baptism. You don't have any choice. The regeneration. What you do have a choice on is whether or not you're going to be filled with the Spirit. That's a volitional choice you make. God's the one who fills us with the Spirit, but we have to make volitional choices. We want to make sure we understand the difference of the filling of the Spirit in contrast with spiritual maturity. Why is this being addressed here? Because this is a doctrine that's confused. Some people equate being filled with the Holy Spirit with being mature spiritually. Not so. A brand new baby believer may be filled with the Holy Spirit and manifest the power of the Holy Spirit in his life. That's an incredible thing. That's an amazing thing. That somebody who just accepted Christ today can be filled with the Holy Spirit and manifest his power. Now, do they have the capacity to manifest the power of the Holy Spirit all, to all the fullness of Christ? No. They don't. 
But can they bear fruit? Can they be filled with the Spirit and bear fruit and manifest His power? Absolutely. Absolutely, from day one. Maturity, on the other hand, involves growth and knowledge through the study of God's Word and the wisdom that comes from the application of accumulated doctrines to life's various trials, all the while being consistently filled with the Holy Spirit. Let me read that again. Maturity, as opposed to being filled with the Spirit, involves growth in knowledge through the study of God's Word and wisdom that comes from the application of accumulated doctrine. So as you learn the Word of God, you don't just write it down in your notebook and stick it on a shelf. I use that example all the time, but I I myself personally, the reason I say that is I myself personally was guilty of the same. I had all kinds of copious notes, and they were wonderful notes, and I would take that binder and stick it on the shelf, and that's where it's at. I wasn't taking that doctrine and using it in my own life. Wisdom comes through application of these things you learn. And one of the things we talked about in the first John study is you will know that you're a born-again believer and you will know that you're maturing in the faith when you yourself see how things are changing in your life. Now, they don't happen overnight. You don't suddenly go into triple super grace and you're automatically jumping around as the maximum mature believer. That doesn't happen overnight, does it? Of course not. Instead, what happens is we grow Little by little, line upon line, precept upon precept, little by little, here, there, here a little, there a little. We grow in the Word of God. But what I'm emphasizing right here is you have to apply it to life's various trials, decisions that you make. Now, I'm not talking about whether you're going to pull out that driveway or that driveway when you leave the parking lot. I'm talking about the significant decisions in our life. We apply doctrine to that, all the while being consistently... Filled with the Holy Spirit. Now that's the key to to maturing is that you have to be consistently filled with the Holy Spirit. Now I mean, whenever you commit a sin, we're going to get to this, but whenever you commit a sin, you break with fellowship. You're no longer filled with the Holy Spirit. You grieve and you quench the Holy Spirit. Okay, that happens. But don't stay there very long. Right? The idea is as soon as you realize you're out of fellowship, as soon as you realize what's happened, confess it and get back in fellowship. And you would say, well, of course, why wouldn't a believer do such a thing? Uh, well, two reasons. One, sin can be pretty fun, can't it? <laughs> right? So we might be enjoying our sin. And two, we can be a little stubborn sometimes. And in our own stubbornness, we may very well realize the conviction of the Holy Spirit has taken place. And we realize that we're not in fellowship with God. And we realize we're not filled with the Holy Spirit. And we realize we're not glorifying God with our lives. But we're so stubborn, we just say, well, you know, I... (laughs) And we're just not going to confess our sins because we're not ready to be back in fellowship. We're, we're We're just... so fired up that we want to stay right where we are. and we're Part of it is, by the way, I'm convinced of this. I've become more convinced of this as I've studied this. I'm convinced that part of it is that it's familiar ground. In our unbelieving life, we lived that way all the time. And so when we encounter a particular situation and we react a certain way, it's familiar ground. And even though we are convicted by the Holy Spirit and we know we're out of fellowship, we know that we're grieving and quenching the Holy Spirit, it's so familiar to us and we're so comfortable in our sins that we almost don't want to confess and get back in fellowship. And that sounds weird, but it's true. I think a lot of believers are just more comfortable. That's their comfort zone is their way of reacting. And in most cases, I would say overreacting to whatever's happened. But my encouragement to you today is as you grow in the Word, get away from that. As soon as you receive that convicting ministry of the Holy Spirit, as soon as that knife sticks in your side and tells you that you're out of fellowship, confess. Get back in fellowship. Because whatever you're dealing with, I promise you it's going to be a lot easier to deal with if you're in fellowship. (laughs) A lot easier to, to deal with. Now... What about, if you are, what about if you're dealing with somebody else who's not in fellowship? This is kind of an aside. It's not on the slides. What about if you're dealing with somebody else who's not in fellowship, maybe even your spouse or your child, and they're not in fellowship? You just want to walk up to them and say, hey, get in fellowship. How well is that, how well is that going to work for you? <laughs> 
not very well. But see, you need to understand, for example, for example, as husbands and wives, I mean, if, uh, if a situation happens and your spouse is out of fellowship, first of all, you might want to look in the mirror and see if you are in fellowship. But once you know you're in fellowship, you need to recognize, you know what, right now is not a really good time for us to talk. I think we need to wait <laughs> for a little bit. And you need to show gentleness and you need to show kindness and you need to show love and patience and all of those things. You don't need to go over and say, let's get in fellowship so we can talk. <laughs> It's not going to work. <laughs> Ask me how I know. So, <laughs> numerous, uh, numerous passages, by the way, speak of the need for spiritual growth. This is not, a, this is not something I'm making up. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4, we looked at that before. Uh, gifted men edify the saints that they might grow up. Ephesians chapter 4, <clears throat> starting in verse 11. It says, he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers. We don't have apostles and prophets anymore today, but we do have evangelists and pastor teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. To the building up of the body of Christ. What, to what end? Well, until we all attain to the unity, the unity of the faith. That's very important. The unity of the faith. And of the knowledge of the Son of God. How well do you know the Son of God? I can tell you right now, I don't know Him very well. I need to know Him a lot better than I know Him. Attain to the unity of the faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man. That's the whole point of the building up of the body of Christ, that we might come to a place of maturity in our faith. To the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Boy, that's a pretty high standard, isn't it? Verse 14, as a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. We read about that in James, didn't we? Read about that in James, the one who can be tossed to and fro. By the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But... Big contrast here in verse 15. But, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into Him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. Do you see all the different things that are talked about here? The equipping of the saints... These evangelists and pastor teachers are sent for the equipping of the saints to the building up of the body of Christ. But look what we have here. We are to grow up. We're all supposed to grow up in all aspects into Him who is the head, even Christ. But look at what happens in verse 16. The whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part causes the growth of the body for the, in, the building up of itself in love. So what does that mean? In order for me, it goes back to what I was talking about, in order for me to be able to minister to you, I have to be growing up myself, don't I? I have to be growing in the Word. And then if I'm growing in the Word... I'm going to be able to help you grow in the Word. And we're all going to grow up together in the Word. And it's a beautiful picture. But if I'm not doing it, if I'm off in la-la land, if I'm walking around in my carnality and my own stubbornness, guess what? I'm not going to be able to help you grow. And in fact, it might be an opportunity for you, come, you to come alongside and minister to me. But the fact of the matter is, we all need to be growing up together according to the proper working of each individual part. Well, the proper working of each individual believer is that we each are in, the, in a path where we're growing up in the Word of God. And that causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in knowledge and understanding and wisdom. Oh, it doesn't say that. The building up of itself, the building up of itself in love. You'll notice love was mentioned multiple times in this passage. Speaking the truth in love, the building up of itself in love. Trust me, you will recognize a mature body of believers when God's love is evident throughout the body. And you'll also recognize a mature body of believers when prayer is a priority in the body of believers. Those are two really good measuring sticks 
for a body of believers is how important is prayer in the life of the believers in the congregation and do you see the love of God evident in the believers in the assembly that's the measuring stick well we are actually out of time so what we'll do is we'll come back to this these passages that talk about uh, growth first peter 2 2 talks about the the mir- milk which is what newborn believers need they need to grow up to the point where they can be able to chew on some meat but at first all you can handle is the milk and we'll go on from there and look at uh, growing in the grace of knowledge now that's a passage second peter 3 18 if anybody's ever been to austin bible church you better know that one and grow in the grace and knowledge of our lord and savior jesus christ but we'll come back and look at that next time. Right now, I'm assuming that's going to be next Sunday, but you know, we found out in recent events with the fires, we don't ever know when the next time is, but uh, the next time we're able to gather, we will return and look at these passages that talk about a need for spiritual growth. But since we are out of time, let's go ahead and close in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we have only begun our study on the filling of the Holy Spirit, and yet even in just these first few points, we already realize that this is a a very important doctrine for us to understand, that uh, we can manifest a power that is beyond anything that we're capable of on our own when the Holy Spirit is in control of our lives and we are under the influence of the Holy Spirit rather than under the influence of alcohol or under the influence of the world or anything else that wants to try to gain influence over us. Father, we, we are in a position, by the decisions we make, we're in a position to be filled with the Holy Spirit and be able, in, in a position where we can bear the fruit of the Spirit in a marvelous way in our lives. And Father, I, I think that many oftentimes believers take that for granted and don't realize what an unbelievable blessing that is, that you have allowed us to be your fellow workers, you have allowed us the blessing of being indwelled by the Holy Spirit, And through your grace, we can be filled with the Holy Spirit and can have a supernatural empowerment. And Father, I pray that we would make the right decisions, that when we receive the conviction of the Holy Spirit, we would confess our sins and be filled. And I pray that we would also recognize that as as time goes on, that our growth, our intimacy with you is dependent upon spending as much time as possible filled with the Holy Spirit. We have this incredible blessing in this day and age of the ministries of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And Father, we, we certainly don't want to grieve Him or quench, uh, quench Him in regard to what He can do in our lives. But so often, I know I do, Father, so often I fall short and I, I fall into the lusts of the flesh and I commit sins that, that are just uh, totally in opposition to what You would have me to do. And Father, I just pray that You would be at work in me and in my weaknesses, in the moments when I fail, that You would Give me conviction as soon as possible. Help me to get to the point where I'll confess and get back in fellowship as quickly as possible. Help me to live my life in such a way that everybody can see the Holy Spirit at work in me. Much the same as we can all look around and see the, uh, the influence of alcohol on somebody. We can recognize somebody is drunk with, uh, with liquor. And Father, I pray that others are able to look at, at us and all of us and see the influence that the Holy Spirit has upon us. Father, we just ask that you... You strengthen us in our moments of weakness, that you guide us, give us understanding and wisdom. Help us to be true bond servants that will glorify Jesus Christ with our lives. We pray these things in his most precious and holy name. Amen.